at API-led integration, sponsored by ETI Software Solutions. Thanks a lot for joining us today. I'm Jeff Boozer, Director of Market Development for our Municipal and Co-op Utility, Broadband. Um, a couple of quick reminders here before we introduce our guest today. This session is interactive. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions via the chat box. If you look over in the little box that's somewhere on your screen, you'll see where that is. Our team will be monitoring those throughout the event and will uh, pose those questions to us as they come through. Our session is also being recorded and will be available to all attendees for future access. Thanks in advance for your participation. Now I'm excited to introduce our distinguished guest, Guy Baventi, a veteran of AT&T. Guy's responsibilities at AT&T included major systems integration and modernization efforts across both the BSS and OSS space. More recently, he led architecture and delivery teams in the digital domain space for other B2C and B2B uh, implementations. He also has a great deal of experience in M&A, organizational development, and driving changes. Uh, he is also the founder of BevTech, a technology company focused on advising software and services companies with a focus on digital transformation. And he happens to be a good friend and a good source of lots of good information. Guy, welcome. It's great to talk with you again. Let's start you, out. This morning. I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's start out today um, doing this. We probably have a mix of non technical and technical people in the audience. Uh, so perhaps you could start with a little high level overview uh, of APIs so that we can all start on the same page. Sure, sure. Um, first, thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. Um, you know, so I, I think maybe, Jeff, to um, describe an API in simple terms, right? Most people understand that an API is an application programming interface. Really, it allows, in its simplest form, two applications to talk to each other. And usually it's used for data exchange, right, between two applications or two systems. It could be more than two. Um, I, I think an analogy that I've seen that I really like is thinking about an API like a door, right? Uh, information could flow in and out of this door. Um, you know, using a simple example, you have program A needing to get some information for program B, but program A serves up a request via an API to program B. Program B fulfills that request, sends a response back to program A. Um, now, maybe adding to that just a little bit, you know, in order to do this, right, you need a standard, uh, a standard and a reusable manner, which, quite frankly, is the value proposition. Um, so, you know, APIs, think again, thinking about that door in my example, there are some standards. It swings in or it swings out, right? It has a lock or it doesn't have a lock. It has a handle, you know, silly, maybe analogy but that's the way to think about it from a non-technical perspective. And from a, a, a little more technical perspective, an API follows the principles of, you know, write once, use many, right? Once it's written, it can be used by many implication uh, applications. And then maybe just one other point, and we can build on this, Jeff. Um, in order to make this um, data exchange interchange work, in computing terms, you know, you need a protocol, right? And, and again, for those maybe not as familiar, I like to describe it as a language, a protocol which defines the standards of that communication uh, interchange between multiple programs. Good, that's helpful. So maybe a little bit more, if you could, on the different types of APIs, um, both you know, in the environment you've worked in and maybe in some of the other environments, any that you want to help us out with here? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe it builds on, you know, um, what, what I just described. I, from, a, from a business point of view, uh, Jeff, you know, I, I typically see APIs categorized in either 
system APIs or process APIs, and I'll even touch on one that I think is more evolving and that's experience APIs. But system APIs uh, are really an API that exposes a backend system to serve up data. Um, an example in, in our um, industry, for example, would be say bill inquiry, right? You have a front end system, could be an online system, could be a CRM, customer care system, that needs to inquire information from a billing system. It could be outstanding payment, right? So uh, that would be an example of leveraging a system API to extract data, say, for an ordering system from a back end system like a billing system. Um, a process API, uh, and, and again, these are just categories. It, it probably is not as meaningful as just getting involved, but a process API usually means you're involving uh, multiple systems uh, or multiple APIs for uh, a business purpose. Uh, an example in uh, that's very common in all industries, in, including telecom, is think about a customer care application in a back office or in a call center where you need um, a 360 degree view of a customer, right? To get that 360 degree view, you're probably gonna to need to pull data and information from multiple systems. So there's APIs that would be considered more that flavor. The experience APIs, just real, real quick, I, I find it interesting. Um, it's really uh, more related to uh, the space that people talk about in terms of e-learning software. And I find it interesting because um, it, it's all about capturing different events and experiences that say your customer could have with you in your different touch points and using uh, APIs to actually grab uh, uh, that event data. Um, so this would support things like, you know, omni-channel where you have maybe stores and a call center and an online uh, e-commerce presence and all the data from those different touch points would be able to be aggregated and, and pulled in a standard way. So that's more like I, I consider those API categories. Um, but it, when you think about APIs from maybe a slightly more technical view um, uh, for those interested, um, you know, you often hear people talk about open source or free APIs. What does that mean? Well, there's a set of APIs that are available for business or, or quite frankly, consumer consumption. Um, I think a good example, let's, Facebook's been in the news a lot, right? So uh, Facebook, if you want to um, uh, gather information on, say, the different applications you follow, you, know, you use the Graph API at Facebook, or if you're uh, a business that wants to run a custom campaign on Facebook, you would use their marketing API. So you see what they've done is they've created a door, right? A way for you to integrate with them. Um, so let me also, you know, I, I brought out, you know, opening it up to the public. Typically when you develop these APIs and, and from my experience, uh, uh, Jeff, to, to your question, you have in an organization that's adopted this practice, you have private APIs, right? With, within your organization, or you could have partner APIs, you don't open it up to the public. Maybe you have a couple partners that you exchange data with, so you can have partner APIs, or as I stated, making them open to the public. But one of the things that definitely it, it gets into more of the technical discussion has to do with, well, what how, what's the style that you're gonna use, these protocols, right? You can't uh, exchange data, you and I, Jeff, between our two applications, we couldn't exchange data if we're not following a set of rules, right? Uh, to make it all make sense and, and quite frankly, to make it work. So um, I'm sure members of this audience and others are familiar with, you know, what, what eventually evolved to uh, an adopted practice of using what they call restful APIs uh, from, um, you know, the uh, adoption of REST which, you know, fancy uh, phrase for representation state transfer, which is really, I think about it as a style of writing APIs with these set of rules, right? 
uh, that are independent, right? They're not tied to a specific uh, computing resource or computing method. So because of that independence, RESTful APIs as a practice um, has become very popular. And it, it's also, um, I'd say the next evolution past what many of us, including myself, uh, started down the path of, uh, and that is the adoption of a service-oriented architecture, what people talk about in terms of SOAP, where there you were basically moving into breaking down these monolithic systems, right, into defined services. Uh, but the challenge with SOAP is, you know, you were pretty much stuck with XML, as the protocol for data exchange, where RESTful APIs have become popular because they one they were easier to adapt than 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 SOAP, but they also allowed various formats. Of course, XML would be one, but HTML, JSON, so on and so forth. Maybe one last point, Jeff, if I may, because um, this is you know people hear JSON. Wait a minute, am I doing this or that? Um, and, and maybe this will be the depth of the, the weeds discussion on the technical side. Uh, but JSON, which is the JavaScript object notation, the reason that's become very popular is probably a couple of reasons, but a couple of them is most would agree it's probably easier, more English-like, um, um, uh, and it's also uh, very lightweight. So it's become popular uh, with online web apps, right? And, and of course, it, it's it's a compatible RESTful API. So, in in a nutshell, you know, share a little bit about the different types, maybe from a business perspective, but maybe also a couple of different styles of how one would build in APIs. Jeff, thanks, guy. That's really helpful. Um, you know, that's it's a topic that does have a lot of technical implications, but it's a fairly straightforward concept that we're trying to achieve with all of that. Thanks for uh, helping break that down and unpack it. So, Guy, you've had a lot of experience in, in some major telecom companies. You've worked with everything from VSS to OSS to, you know, web-based uh, online engagement. And, you know, we've talked about that a lot in the past on other conversations we've had, but I know you've had a lot of experience in trying to achieve the objectives and with APIs and things in the business. Um, uh, could you share with us a little bit of the, the pivot experience you had around the API uh, integration projects and experience you've had? Sure, Jeff. Should I start with showing all the scar tissue? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe saying pivot instead of pivot. <laughs> Um, no, serious. I, I, yeah, I'll share my experience. I, I think a good place to start is maybe describe those environments. Um, very common, depending on you know the size of the organization. Uh, you may only have component pieces of this, but I definitely came from a world where you know you had an embedded legacy environment, right? And and we all know that basically legacy means they've been around for a while. Uh, many systems, but the key, which is relevant, Jeff, to our discussion, is that the way these systems uh, inter exchange data and talk to each other was more of what we call a point-to-point -point interface, which means, you know, remember my program A to program B? Well, program A would build a point-to-point -point to program B, and program C, maybe for the same data, would build a point-to-point -point that it needs to program B. So in essence, you know, there is redundancy and, 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 and a lot of custom code. Um, so a legacy environment like that, um, adding to that complexity that come from a world where there are a lot of mergers and acquisitions involved, right? So it wasn't complex enough. You now have uh, BSS and OSS application architectures uh, that have many um, uh, tenants. Um, and you have, um, at least from my experience, uh, I worked in a, a, a mix of uh, custom code, custom applications, and packaged software, you know, like the uh, ETI software, um, uh, CAT solutions with custom code. Um, and maybe a couple more things before I get into the experience. Um, I think it's fair to state that uh, project uh, 
uh, uh, cycles, the length of projects was longer, and, and it's always longer, right, than any of us wanted. And the project costs, um, you know, needed attention too. Um, but by the way, it wasn't all legacy in this mix. Um, part of that environment include what, what I put in the advanced computing uh, uh, space, things like, you know, uh, an omni-channel framework I talked about in my example, the adoption, you know, things like, you know, big data, business intelligence tools, and even, you know, um, uh, more advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. So you have this very complex ecosystem. And then, so how do you get to an API pivot? And you know, I thought about, you know, how we went down there, I was reflecting on that. And I think it's fair to state that we were pushed to make the pivot. Um, I, I think that's fair. Um, but the journey did start, uh, you know, I alluded to uh, services oriented architecture, uh, that protocol. So um, the journey did start more from a, an adoption of a shared services model using that style but the truth is, in, in the different organizations where we went down that path, it didn't do enough for the speed that we wanted uh, and, and the elimination of the complexity. So this edict, right, this push of adopting an API-driven framework was very real. Um, I, I also, as I reflect on it, I, I think it was necessary, um, Jeff, to just say, this is the way we're going to do things around here. But it was hard. So, you know, because an edict is not enough, right? And, and if you don't mind, I want to share uh, from my experiences some of the challenges, which would, you know, give uh, uh, maybe a sense of things to anticipate, right? Things to think about, maybe even in advance would be good. Um, the first thing to anticipate is really. How are you going to motivate your vendor partners to make this pivot with you? That, that's key. We come back to that. So um, working and anticipating a vendor reaction, I think, is key. Um, anticipating uh, the reality of costs that the truth is, once you embark on building an API framework, you'll probably see costs slightly climb before the decline, at least that's been my experience. Uh, similarly, with uh, startup time, and to, you know, you're, you're doing this because you want to go fast, but you may slow down before you go fast. Uh, a big one, at least for us, and uh, contributed to some of that scar tissue I, I talked about, is what I call risks trade-off, right? And what do I mean by that? You have uh, what I like to call the current mode of operation, which may be point to point, right? And you have the next generation or future mode, which may be the adoption of an API. Well, there's risks trade off. I, it wasn't unusual to hear teams wanting to go current mode, point to point, even after adopting the API pivot, if you will. Why? Because it was, in, in many people's mind, easier, faster. We know how to do it. It's gonna uh, reduce the risk of you know, target date misses. So these trade-offs, right, of you know, say in this case time, you know, versus moving to a more efficient model, uh, I think are things to anticipate and, and something you know we we were challenged with regularly. Uh, here's another big one, and and again, it's very related, and, and I would tell folks this is one of the top lessons for me and my organization and it has to do with the need of um, uh, a very uh, clear architecture but and we come back to architecture because this point i'm making here jeff has to do with more of the rules of engagement for the apis and what do i mean by that when you think about apis and what they do you know, you're going to have some technical decisions that need to be addressed. Things like throttling, right? You know, if you have two applications talking to each other, uh, is one going to throttle, you know, uh, the communication? What about availability, right? Application A is, a say, an online system, and it's up 24-7. And maybe a back-end system 
goes down for some batch process. And I need to do that bill inquiry all the time, 24 seven. What about error handling, right? If that transaction fails or, you know, falls out somewhere, how's that gonna be managed? Um, scalability and response times. Uh, from my experience, when you talked about, part of my experience included building um, e-commerce solutions, uh, online systems for both B2C and B2B. This was a real issue. We had very aggressive response time SLAs, right? Very aggressive. How long will a customer stay waiting for a screen to flip? Well, you know, the complexity of the architectures often required some backend data dip, if you will, right? Using an API. Well, you can't have an SLA for online that doesn't consider or change the SLAs for backend and how that API uh, works in between. A couple more things uh, related to um, uh, these rules of engagement uh, have to do with um, integration uh, into uh, a CI/CD framework, right? The continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline that most, many IT organizations have adopted to be able to make changes quickly. Well, if I'm making a change, say, to a front-end system and I'm using a CI/CD pipeline where I introduce change quickly, and it includes an API that calls a backend system, you need to think about the level of testing before you progress that change forward. And then I'd say anticipating the overall life cycle management of these APIs, right? The rules of engagement uh, for changes, right? And, and the governance that goes with it, Jeff, right? Who owns the, by the way, who owns the API, right? Who's responsible if it doesn't work? Is it the calling application, the receiving um, side? Uh, and maybe one last thing, and maybe this will come up, uh, Jeff, as we go on. Um, spent a lot of time talking about there, at least some of the technical aspects, but I wouldn't say that that was the hardest in my experience. The hardest part of the experience and the pivot had to do with the cultural aspects, right? Needing to get the organization ready, needing to get those vendors uh, that are part of your ecosystem to agree. Um, and really the movement from more of a silo-based thinking application by app application to more a collaborative way of thinking uh, that's broader and wider that looks across. I'd say th those are some of the key experiences. Thanks for those insights, that, especially the last one there on culture. Uh, in fact, I was just making a note here as we were talking. If Culture, I think, is probably the single biggest obstacle to making progress within organizations as a vendor of software to the industry that specializes in you know, integrating networks, devices, and databases is what we do. Um, you mentioned the, the inertia or the lack of uh, momentum amongst vendors to actually cooperate with each other via the APIs, which is something that's most everyone has adopted to some degree at this point so it's not as big a challenge as it used to be but the switch in culture and the underlying training skill sets resources to move from the legacy world of mostly point to point into newer integration strategies and approaches seems to be seems to be one of the biggest things and it's a business issue that even before you adopt the strategy and approach you can start working on the culture through education and those kinds of things i think that's a really really good point you brought up thanks for doing that so let's follow that up with why you think there's so much uh, i'll use the word confusion in the industry about apis and what they do and how they do it etc yeah yeah well um and people probably have a list of a hundred, right? I, uh, as I, you know, as I think about a couple, and um, I think the one that comes to mind first is the confusion stemming from the available tools in the marketplace, right? Um, I was looking at uh, a Gartner uh, 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 Magic Cube, right, where they talk about some of the leaders, and it's amazing. The list of vendors doesn't get smaller, Jeff. It, it's getting bigger, 
And, and, and again, no, no offense to um, any vendors because I understand uh, their intent, but some of the marketing uh, around those tools sometimes leads to the confusion uh, because th those tool sets are evolving, but in many ways, you still have some API tools that their um, core competency is more in the design and build, right? Maybe they have like a plug and play type uh, uh, tool set, um, but their, their strength is more in the API builds. Uh, you have some that started and probably still have strengths in the uh, API management, the repository, that discovery, right? To see what APIs are out there. Um, and then, you know, you have some of the tools that fall, you know, another term that's been adopted is API ops, right? You know, and then, you, know you hear DevOps and this ops, but API ops, but most of those tools their focus is on that monitoring that I talked about for availability, reliability, right? It's basically um, um, resiliency, rules definition, maybe alerting. So part of the confusion, I do think, stems from the tool space and some of the marketing data that's out there, which I think gets to the other one, Jeff, and that is, well, where do I start? I mean, it sounds good if people buy into it. Do I go buy a tool first? Is that where I start? Do I define that reference architecture is that where i start which i'd say yeah do that first if you're going to pick one or one of the two okay um oh by the way do i do a small proof of concept right I, which isn't a bad idea right an edict isn't let's do a small proof of concept maybe we would have done one but um but where to start sometimes um uh, contributes to that confusion you know because there are so many different opinions on it right um my, my my point of view on that is start. Right? <laughs> it's not you know, forget forget start. Um, and then maybe the other one you started touching on this, Jeff. I think in in, in your comment on the last uh, question uh, with training. But I I'm going to take it to a different level. I think a lack of understanding at I'll call it the executive level. Uh, uh, I mean people understand it somewhat what it is, uh, but really grasping. Uh, at the macro level, why it's important, right? How it changes the way uh, software companies do business and what it can do for you as an operator. Um, and it, similar things like, you know, you all have done uh, at ETI, when I look at the more modular approaches and the integration points with those modules. And, and maybe with that too, Jeff, at the exec level, not only understanding it, but a reasonable, ROI expectation, I, 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 I think, you know, because the confusion is, boy, I'm going to spend some money, I get it, it's going to get me to a better place, what can I expect as a return? Um, I, I think being reasonable um, would make sense. Yeah. Good points, and, and I'm sure you can provide a little more background on this, but this discussion around a change in strategy and a change in approach for APIs is less a technical conversation, which the technical side is implementation. It's really a business-driven kind of conversation in the environments mm -hmm. we all operate in with everything that's beginning to go on and expand in networks and uh, the software that supports the customer engagement all of these things, the amount of data you have to pull together is exponentially going up over the next few years. And that you've got to share amongst different applications in the ecosystem and the infrastructure. So there's this discussion of the business return that I think often doesn't really get enough attention, just as you were saying, um, the ROI, but it's also ROI in terms of a number of other things like time to market or whatever. I wonder if you might elaborate just a little bit more on your experience and how you've looked at some of these decisions at the business level in your experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I will tell you, you know, I mentioned the business case has to be realistic. Um, I, w when you look at the return on investment, Jeff, you really need to give the organization time to reach that level of maturity, 
okay? So the way I've looked at it is how much soak time, if you will, what, what does it take, right, to get to um, an API-led uh, integration environment, right? So the way I've looked at it is to um, understand and accept that in the immediate term, you will not see that return. Um, you may actually see um, things go, you know, uh, more expensive before you actually start yielding some of the benefits. Uh, so I think that realistic point um, and, 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 and communicating up, Jeff, those expectations I think is key, right? When will we see some of those benefits? Um, the other thing too, and I think it's related to that, um, and again, it's probably more cultural uh, in nature at this point, um, but we have a tendency not always to be as transparent and share some information. So we spend a lot of time, especially in the technical world, talking about those things that I talked about with protocols, but helping people understand, and, and this is something that can always be done better. And, and, and I reflect on some of my experiences, I think we could have done even better, is helping even the technicians understand the value proposition and what it does. And maybe one other part that's hard to measure, Jeff, um, I kind of, I think about like job enrichment, right? Uh, integrating and, you know, uh, bringing in more advanced techniques is uh, more satisfying to most technicians uh, than, you know, continuing down a traditional same uh, path of point-to-point -point solutions. So there's value, especially in today's economy, right, with uh, uh, competition for talent, but there's value in enriching uh, jobs uh, of engineers, at least that's my point of view. Yeah, yeah, good. So yeah. why, so with your experience and working with other companies and the, the network of people that you've known for all these years, why is it that we see this struggle to pivot to a, a more modern approach to APIs? Yeah. Well, I I, I think there's there's some things missing is, is what I'd say. I, I mean, part of this is also, again, you know, uh, related to maybe your prior questions you know, I kind of think about three pillars for any change, definitely true for APIs, and, you know, kind of commitment, clarity, and collaboration. Um, you need to get a commitment to understand it, to your point, a commitment to spend money to do something about it, and, and a commitment, quite frankly, to the effort. To build APIs, you have to decompose your key mega processes, I call them, you know, ordering, billing, provisioning, care, activation. You have to understand them. Um, so a commitment to do those things. Um, clarity comes from, you know, um, the availability of a reference architecture. Usually when people say, hey, you know, we went down that path, whether it's this pivot or other pivots, um, you know, I, I, I often find that maybe the lack of success was very much related to a lack of clarity. I think a reference architecture and a common data model that defines those protocols that I mentioned, you know, um, with those uh, uh, open principles, I think that's key. It helps people get that clarity. Um, and then that collaboration, you know, is, isn't just with the vendors, but it's also with the internal teams, which, you know, um, is sometimes surprising, but it's very real, right? Um, um, and, and, you know, so some of the other struggles, um, I, I think, come down to a few things that may uh, silo thinking, right? Well, you often think about why do people move into a silo thinking point of view? We start reflecting on maybe some negative principles, but not so much the case. Once people accept that, hey, it's natural, then you could do something about it. Because silo thinking includes things like, hey, pride of ownership. I, I like what I built and I think it works well. Um, control, hey, you know, I know how to make the performance, you know, uh, response time be what I need it to be. How about just 
people feel comfortable with what they know or you know things like trust but th those elements um i think go under the silo thinking struggle uh, or attribute that contributes to struggle um i touched on this and you know those who know me know that i'm straight up uh but you know let's face it um most companies in computing telcos including leverage um temporary resource and out and, and outsourcing is a reality that's fine there's nothing wrong with it but you have to understand sometimes a push into something like this may be uh, uh, a conflict or what let me say it in other terms you know uh, not everybody likes this but someone's cost could be somebody else's profit right um so um I, I think that leads to the struggle um, and, and, and makes the pivot longer. Uh, the absence of clear direction I touched on. Um, the, the other one too, as I reflect back for us that uh, made the bigger pivot a challenge, uh, had to do with past failures. You know, hey, we tried it, it didn't work. We're, it's, it's never going to and, and, and really having the um, uh, wherewithal to stick to it um and and then the other one um it comes down to accountability so i talked about making it very clear on expectations of ownership jeff right like who builds the api oh no by the way this doesn't have to be i didn't touch on this earlier but it's important this doesn't have to be let's build all the apis and then we could start you can move into a model where you build the key APIs. I don't think you should start with nothing, right? Build the core APIs, but adopt a practice where I think, this is my opinion, if you need an API and it doesn't exist, you build the API and then you can own the API. The, uh, the, the other point I was going to add before I threw in that thought um, with accountability is make it very clear those performance SLAs, those reliabilities SLAs and availability. You can't have an organization that you know adopts this practice and others like you know microservices architecture. Very similar comments could be made there, but you can't move to these new frameworks without addressing the cross organization uh, expectations. They're like internal SLAs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait couple of things there on what you said uh, speaking of the silo thinking one of the things we observe a lot that i think plays back into that culture conversation we've had through this is by just natural means because of the nature of the silos in our infrastructure in you know broadband telecom companies organizations have been built up around those silos organizational structures and things so there's a natural kind of competition for resource attention, et cetera, that is built around those silos and, and the ability to walk back in and, and kind of break those down is, is a struggle and, and something that companies have to spend some time on to really realize some of the benefits. The other one that I just want to reiterate as a, a vendor of software that does these kinds of things is is your point about you don't have to build it all before you get started or you don't have to do everything at once this kind of approach as part of a full reference architecture as you describe can be done just by starting with the next one you need to build and over time you know if you've got a big maintenance one that needs to be redone or one of the uh, maintenance project on an existing api use that opportunity to cast it into new technology those kinds of things so it's not a a huge one-time big end-to-end -end project it can be spread out over some time um well let's turn more to the okay we've talked about the concepts of the tech a little bit what should i get out of this what kind of value propositions to the business and to my customers uh and to my ecosystem uh as well should i expect out of api-led integration yeah yeah why do it right I yeah. just, I just uh, want, uh, I'll come to this question you just posed, but I want to add something to your last set of comments. Um, I, I'll tell you what, if you really want to um, 
change the culture or maybe expedite it, including your vendors, make it part of your you know selection process. Um, and I, I know you all have done a, a great job with this and, and, and you've invested, um, uh, Jeff, in, in the e ETI model uh, with your modular approach and the different components. The, the reason I appreciate um, buying solutions that have moved to a more open architecture is that I don't have to buy it all, right? Uh, I can pick and choose. And oh, by the way, I can you know use some interface points with what I already may have invested in. So um, for me, you know, making it part of a criteria for selecting uh, vendor partners, um, I, I, I think is a good practice. Um, you asked about the value proposition. I, I, I think there's two that are obvious and, and maybe two that are less obvious, uh, at least maybe to some. I think the two obvious ones, I would guess most people are thinking, hey, you've said it a few times, speed and cost, right? Speed and cost, speed and cost. Um, but past just building faster, I think the real value uh, from that, Jeff, comes from the time to market point that, that you raised, which is such a competitive uh, uh, advantage uh, factor, right? Um, the cost, right? We're not just talking about lower cost to build, but we're talking about significant lower cost to maintain, right? Ongoing costs. Some people talk about it as ongoing support costs. But those are two obvious and very real. Uh, they could, you can make a business case right there. Um, the two may be uh, not immediately as obvious. Uh, the first one would be uh, the reliability that I talked about. But in this case, I like to define it as getting the same response to the same inquiry. Um, boy, you know, um, let's talk about in our uh, industry, right? You ever hear people talk about, boy, if I go online and I do something like an eligibility check, right, for broadband uh, availability, I get one answer. Maybe you go, to, you know, you call a call center and you get a different answer. I don't know, maybe a store gives you a third. But nevertheless, it wasn't like an intentional, you know, hey, let's do this three different ways and give three different answers. These systems evolve over time. But a pivot, to APIs and maybe even the adoption of you know microservices architectures ensures the reliable response, right? That an eligibility check from any of those channels returns the same answer, right? Um, the the other one, uh, again, maybe not as obvious, has to do with you know the space of security and privacy. You almost think the obvious. You're like, boy, you know, do I need to be concerned with security if I move down this path. I think quite the opposite. Why is that? Um, security and privacy issues uh, um, or you know risks, vulnerabilities uh, is a better term, are often related to you know uh, access, right? And through an API you can restrict access uh, to data or you can restrict access in in, in terms of uh, the level of data that's uh, provided to different audiences. So, you know, speed, cost, but also reliability uh, and security, uh, I think, are all part of the value proposition. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. As a software provider that does this kind of stuff, we're using API led technology now, and the security aspect of, of that you men mentioned especially for us as a vendor of software that gets used by multiple people, that security is a huge motivation for us to have adopted this, as well as be able to pass this along, the benefits along that you described to our customers. But uh, that was a really good point, one that doesn't always come up. So we're getting near the end of the time here, but uh, if you don't mind, take a couple of minutes and let's look forward two three years from now and what would a company that's undertaken this pivot as we've used throughout the conversation what do they look like now that they've adopted this uh, ipi led approach to integrating their data hmm. yeah 
Well, you have, you, you hopefully, uh, looking forward a couple of years out, you hopefully would see that, you know, the realization of that speed cost reliability we talked about. Uh, but but I want to uh, focus my comments here on um, behaviors, you know, uh, behaviors and practices. Um, in, in such an organization that is API led, um, you, you would see, uh, I'll call them business end users, the non-technical folks being more prescriptive right, and how solutions come to bear, right? Which means, by the way, you have that uh, uh, ability to explore and discover what's available. But business end users be more prescriptive on what's built and how it's built. That, that's huge, by the way. Um, I don't think you see that a lot. Um, what else would you see? Um, you would see technical teams shift into more of an integrator role, right? And as an integrator, you're using these frameworks, APIs being one that we talked about. You're using that reference architecture. You're exploring the integration flows and what data exists. Um, and, and you're building, you're putting pieces together, you know, moving to that building block approach, that style of development, um, almost like a self-serve integration environment, right? Where I can pull the needed pieces. Uh, you'd see that. Um, hand in hand with my first comment, you'd see less need to understand the technical side, if you will, right? The 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 sausage making, right? What's going on behind the curtain? Um, uh, you'd be focused more on business outcomes using you know various objects. Uh, probably the other thing you'd see, you know, you hear people talk about low code and no code uh, solutions, um, but you definitely would see a shift to more of a low code model. It starts coming to life and, and quite frankly, is rewarded, right, for organizations to move um, in that direction. Great comments. Great comments. Thanks for all of that. This has been a really yeah. good conversation. Um, before we sign off, and see if anybody that happens to be uh, listening to us has any questions or anything. If, uh, while we sort of wind down here, if there's anything that's popped up, that would be open. Looks like uh, the good news is you've answered every question already. No, no, actually there was one, there was one yeah. that uh, came up uh, online, uh, not on, on one of the uh, social sites that I thought was interesting oh, okay. and it, it yeah, had to do with uh, ODA. Oh, and, and by the way, there's been a couple of ODAs in our industry, an early one being, uh, it sounds almost related, where you move to um, common uh, extensions of files like PDFs and such. But I think most people now are familiar with, I talked about an open development architecture, ODA, um, and, and you know, the the comment or question was hey love to hear more how this fits with um an oda movement and and i think you know based on this discussion uh hopefully you know people would see that apis and being api led is a necessary component uh to reach oda it, i really it really is and and why does one care because of those things that i mentioned jeff because it's easier to integrate components uh, uh, from one vendor or from multiple vendors, okay? So anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. Great, great. Okay, well, Guy, thanks a bunch for taking the time to uh, share your experience and expertise today. Uh, for those of you attending, uh, we appreciate your taking the time to listen and uh, hopefully you learned something useful from the conversation. Just want to remind you that uh, the, the recording of this uh, session will be available uh, to you um, and through our website as well. You'll get an email as well as 